But if I have a different opinion, I'll let you know. And if your opinion isn't a good one, I'll let you know. Would you take Bo or Max Domi right now? When Jim Benning gets to the table and he sees JT Miller, I think that's what made him hit the gas. You make those like trades. Look at what he's done being emerged into our lineup. It's night and day. He's going to be our next Sammy Sal, besides playing half a game a year. So sick of people acting like he hasn't been that bad. He has been atrocious. Get these mental gymnastics you have to go through to get to call and mind space on this trade is just to me it's way too much mr horvet has been bad he's our captain this is such a stupid take colin <laughs> how's it going guys the hockey hour is back with another episode today dylan austin and i are joined by canucks reporter for the province and vancouver sun patrick johnson how's it going patrick thank you for joining gentlemen, us gentlemen thanks for having me happy to be here yeah, very humbling to have you on. Just wanted to appreciate. I know you're a busy guy, so I thank you very much for joining us. It, it means a lot. So, well, I have a, I sort of have a standing rule these days, especially <laughs> you know, given COVID. But uh, you know, yeah. pod, there. I mean, we were, Andrew Walker and I were joking about it on air. There's so many podcasts out there, but you know what? I'm more than happy to uh, to say yes. And yeah, uh, it, it means you know. a lot, really. It's, yeah. it's good for yeah. us, our yeah, yeah, like, yeah, fan yeah. guys, because you guys yeah. are closer to the team, right? So it's cool. It's definitely um, been awesome to see the response that uh, bigger people in the media have had to coming on yeah. and joining us on this little podcast of, of four viewers. So it's awesome. So we appreciate it. <laughs> hey, we're at like 15, all right? Come on. All right. Yeah, no. <laughs> but no, exactly. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. So we all know why we're here. We're talk here to talk about the Canucks, of course. And uh, before we get into it, I kind of, when we have guests on our show, like we don't, we're not, we don't like to interview. We like to make it more of a discussion, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, Smart move. So, yeah. So basically, uh, our first kind of uh, talking point would be like, you know, what are your overall thoughts on this team right now? Because we're all thinking like, <laughs> that's all over the place right now. So like, just from your point of view, what do you see right now? Basically. Oh. <laughs> <It's>, question, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> but, well, I mean, I think it's what everyone's saying is that, you know, there's a lot, there's, let's be clear, like there's good stuff on this team. Like there's yeah. like clearly some great young pieces you know exactly what you need um but it's an inefficient team you know there's yeah. a lot of like you know that bottom six there's just not a lot happening and if you're going to be a serious contender for the future you need you need tons of guys to quote someone we used to know you know they need a lot of guys and they don't have a lot of guys yet and you know there's yeah of course there's still some interesting prospects there's a couple guys yet to come like you know, Vasily put Colson will be a great addition when he gets in the lineup. Mm. Jack Rathbone, of course, had an incredible debut with the Comets last night. Um, but it, it's so, it's still so piecemeal. And you look at a team like LA, who's having a great season in the West. And I think maybe, you know, Canadian fans aren't as aware of just because we're so focused on the North Division. Um, but, you know, you look at a team like L.A. and they've just got young guys coming out their ears. And that's just not the case here. You know, it's good. But, you know, to, to steal a point, I think Thomas Durant's made, you know, we were talking about this earlier this week, and I don't, you know, I'm not sure if he said it anywhere. Maybe he said it on the bandcast. But, um, you know, if you need your best guys to be A-plus every night for you to have a chance at success, that's not good. Like, your guys are going to have yeah. off nights and you need yeah. other things. And the fact of the matter is, you know, there there have been blips here and there from guys like Brandon Sutter and and uh, Tyler Mott. But really, you know, the, if you're not having guys that you can bump up, you know, you look at the lack of roster, roster flexibility. I wrote about this after the game on Thursday night that, you know, if the only move that um, – if the only move that Travis Green can really make is to bump Jake Vertanen into the top six – and drop JT Miller to the third line. Like, that's it. Mm. Like, there's no other moves. Like, what else is there? I mean, you could put Adam Godet in, but that's, you know, I mean, he hasn't been playing, you know, I mean, he can't score. He, yeah. he you know, and and to go way back, I mean, Godet in the end, like, just as a side note, has, like, there's nothing, you know, he, he can play, he's clearly an NHLer, I think, but like, there's nothing about him that stands out and said, yes, this guy is going to be, you know, this is a guy that, that if on a better, on a different team, on a worse team, he'd be the second line center, you know? What, what and that bothers, to me becomes the problem. What bothers me is that like, even like you're saying, like you can't expect our top guys to perform every night at A plus levels and that's fair, but 
that's when you expect the other guys to jump in like our, our depth and we just don't have it and they're being paid like they should be doing it that's right. my point yeah, right. that's where it's ridiculous yeah 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 exactly so you know i mean in the end it's a team that I, probably not as bad as as we've seen but but at the end of the day i mean they're not a three i don't think they're a 375 team you know i don't Oh, sorry, oh, cutting out, cutting out, out a little, little bit. bit. You're certainly not at the loss, you know, as an important goalie, you know, but. Sorry, you just cut out there a bit. It was hard to. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just saying, I mean, I don't think anybody came into the year thinking that this was going to be a team that was going to match last year, but like, yeah. I don't think this is a 375 team. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but exactly. that's still not good enough. Like, to make the playoffs. You know, to make the playoffs at this point, you need to be a 575 team. And I'm not sure they were. I mean, I, I thought they were to go in the year. I thought they'd do just enough, given the competition. But Edmonton's been better than I thought they would be. Um, yeah, I think, I think, have been. I think realistically, Winnipeg has been better. And adding Dubois makes up for a lot. Their defense has been a lot better than I expected it would be. Like, Neil mm-hmm. Pionk, I think, has really turned some heads. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, you know, Montreal. I mean, I picked Montreal to win the division. Of course, they're spinning their wheels right now. Um, I still think they're a playoff team, yeah. but uh, you know, anyway, you know, yeah. so in the end, the Canucks like haven't been as good as even, I think, you know, haven't or have been worse than I think people thought they would be. And oh, even yeah. what people thought they would be was still going to be, you know, have a hard time making the playoffs. Yeah. I thought at their best, they could at least challenge for one. And right now we're like barely had of Ottawa. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just not even close to what I even, I expect. I didn't expect them to good challenge for the top spot, but yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. but good to point, your point, like, oh, and to ahead, your sorry. point, I, we don't have, uh, you know, a plan for long-term success because we're not being able to bring in players that build out our bottom six and mm-hmm. give us that supporting cast. Like they say, teams like Tampa Bay, they're doing that every year, bringing in new players that get taken away one or two years later and added to another team, but yeah. they've got someone else to respond and fill that spot. Even if it takes them a year to develop, we just don't have that ability right now. And mm-hmm. that's where my head is starting to turn a little bit to question, you know, our drafting ability and in, in the deep rounds. So. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, I think the truth of the matter is, I mean, it was always likely that they were going to have a hard time with their, with their draft last fall. Um, you yeah. know, when you pick only in, not until the fourth round, I mean, that's low percentage picks. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you talk to people and the, the swings they cut, took even then, I think are not, I don't think people are very imp- terribly impressed with the cuts they took. Like Yoni Irmo, there's, you can see physically why he has appeal. Like, you know, this big, Dude, can skate looks like he's got some puck skills, but everyone says you know he his hockey IQ is just not. He's a third round pick, right? He's the he was the fourth round. Fourth round, okay, fourth yeah. round. Fine. And Jackson Coons is like everyone. A couple of people are like he's not even the best player on his team, you know. And you know, I can't. Everyone says can't skate. You know, I mean, you could in many ways you can fix skating, but you know, you look at that draft and. Uh, Jacob Truscott, I think is, seems like a nice kid, but uh, you know, I mean, in the end it's, it's, he's not, he's certainly, you know, maybe he plays at Michigan and he's a defenseman and he grew up near Tyler Mott, but you know, I don't think anybody's going to argue that he's the second coming at Quinn Hughes, you know, the Victor, the person, Victor person, who was the seventh round pick, I think was an, he's, you know, people say he's, he's, he's the interesting pick of this draft. Um, but even then realistically upside is that he might be a good AHL defenseman. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and uh you know yesterday obviously jack rathbone played his first game and i saw you yeah. t- we tweeted there about him and i like seeing that because you know he's he's being propped up pretty well here and you know mm-hmm. trent call was saying that he walks the blue line really well yeah and that's awesome to hear that you know so yeah, yeah. that's really that's really positive positive. and that's you know i mean that is an example of a of a you know a scouting win and something that you can point to and saying yeah this is a guy that's like i think it's clear that he's mm-hmm. going to be a factor in this team in the coming seasons, you know, and that's yeah. a good thing. Like he, right. he is the kind of guy that, you know, if, if, depending on what you think of all your levy and say you levy is a fine third pairing defenseman, you know, which isn't what you want a first round pick to be, no. but here we are, mm-hmm. you know, and then there's some circumstance in that, you know, Rathbone's the kind of guy that you do want. He's, he looks like he could push to be a second pairing guy, you know, 
and and that's what you need you want to in the end if you're looking at how you build your team you want to build from the you want to push people down the lineup yeah right you, exactly. you don't want to fill in the lower slots you want to use guys that were on the second line becoming on the third line you know and and that you know i mean realistically that's what niels holglander should be like it's fine it's good that he's made the second line he's played well i mean maybe he could turn into something more mm -hmm. but in the big picture if you end up with niels holglander on your third line not because he's regressed but because you have guys coming up yeah. above him that's a good thing exactly yeah exactly. there's not a lot of that in the system right now no yeah, I love I love this talk about young guys. We don't get into this nearly enough. <laughs> yeah, we really don't. But we're, but we're I mean, to my credit, I'm not that much in depth and following these guys. But um, you seem to be really knowledgeable about this. And I just have a hypothetical question, I guess. Do you think the Canucks will be smart enough to make a uh, a strong push going after Jordan Kawaguchi as he comes out of the NCAA? This He's is a not something I know. Yeah, Dude, okay. I don't know. I just thought you might know he's he's from he's from, uh, you know, Abbotsford. He plays yeah. in North Dakota, just like Brock yeah. Besser, just like yeah. half of our prospect pool. Yeah, he's the captain of that team. He's <laughs> been a back to back Kobe Baker finalist. And he likes he likely fits the holes that we need in our top six. And I don't know why nobody talks about this. So I don't know. Maybe maybe you can uh, take a look into he, this a little bit later. Here's but. the thing I would say about him. Um, you know, there, yeah, of course. I mean, here's the thing I would say about him. He. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like you said, a little bit late. Like he's already 23. He's turning 24 this year. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he's been a good player at a really good program. Like there's no doubt about it. And like you said, local guy. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly always been interest in that. And I think, I, I you know, he is the kind of player um, that, you know, always you know will draw the eyes of many teams. Yeah. You know, he's not an unknown player, right? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt they'll be looking at him, um, and and certainly we'll have had a conversation. Uh, you know, I I don't know enough about sort of his sort of projection because, yeah, like, in the end, him. he's good. By the time they sign him, he's going to be 24, right? Yeah, like realistic. 23. Yeah. You know, so a 24 year old player, it's kind of a finished product. There's not a whole mm -hmm. lot. That's true. Right, and so the yeah. like the comparison point. Like, here's two comparison points of recent seasons. Three, three comparison points, really. You've got Mark Michaelis, you got Brogan Rafferty, you got Josh Tevis, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. three guys that were draft, or, you know, that were signed by the Canucks out of college, um, you know, who, who were already in their mid twenties and, you know, Rafferty, but, you know, Rafferty's played a game in the NHL this year. Um, and, you know, maybe he'll get a look again. I don't know. He didn't have a very good game and he knows it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's not a lot of leeway right now at that end of the lineup like, yeah you've got a lot of already guys in that space if if he you know come in and play this incredible game you know you would know that they would be looking at it again this is this is kind of the the the, the tough part about sports is that there's a lot of guys in that kind of edge of the lineup category and a lot of it's about circumstance and timing so so if rafferty is kind of the top end of that category of player um, you know, Josh Tevez was a bet and he scored his first, inning, his first, let's put it this way, scored his first pro goal last night. He didn't have a great year last year for Utica, didn't play a lot, play a lot in Kalamazoo, or sorry, his first AHL goal, you know, and so Tevez was like, Tevez and Rafferty were both bets of a similar type, which was like, these are guys who've been, can skate, they're both, they're smart, like literally smart and, and clearly have a sort of a modern defenseman kind of game and they were both bats and Rafferty may work out and Tevez probably isn't going to work out and then Michaelis is the next factor because he's you know he's the forward he's the center you know everybody I talk to thinks you know like he would be fine in the lineup but it's also about circumstance and the coach you know Travis Green in the end in the moment and he's willing to play young guys if there's a top end there's a clearly like, like, like Neil Songlander is an example of that right like you mm -hmm. put him in the lineup and he's like go you know and that's you know he did it with Quinn Hughes um mm -hmm. but he's also got his sort of steady veterans that he knows and if you know you're Travis Green and you're trying to like think about your future you don't have a contract and you don't know where you're going to be next year but you want to be somewhere whether it's here or another team like you need to show that your team is putting their best step forward and in that scenario right now you know where he's still like trying to make the playoffs because like there is that dream chance of making the playoffs um he's gonna play you know he's not gonna make 
he's not he's not he's yeah. a poker player he's not going to yeah. make bets with a with a with a hand he knows next to nothing about and yeah. mark michaelis even though he should probably be fine is a net total unknown and he's just like no we're not putting him in unless we have to well so, while we're on so there's this... your kawaguchi yeah it's a long answer basically yeah, I, yeah. yeah sure yeah. but like he may he more, the, the odds are is that in the end He's a borderline, you know, he's, he's Justin yeah. Bailey. He's a smaller, you know, he's a smaller Justin Bailey. That's, that's, you know. Touché. Well, while we're on this topic, cause I was going to bring it up later, but I want to ask you personally, why is your levy being taken out of the lineup for Hamnick then? Cause the levy has been fine this year and he's not hurting the team at all. And Hamnick actually is just coming off injury. Yeah. So I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, I mean, in the end, like this is the coach's preference. Kawaguchi was a guy that he pushed for. Because he just can't, or not Kawaguchi. Uh, okay, yes, you got you. Hamnet, Hamnet. <laughs> yeah. So I've still, still got Sorry, Kawaguchi yeah. on my screen. Okay. Um, but no, I mean, you know, this, this is a this is a fair question. This is one of those ones. Like I generally am a defender of Travis Green, and this is one of those ones where, you know, he's made a decision that. I mean, it, it is a little bit shelf like deck chairs, you know. Like, Yo Levy's been fine. He's been okay. Like, he's, he's been pretty good, moments. I think. He's been pretty. Good. I think pretty good is. I, I, I think you're allowed to say that. I'm going to say no. I think it's a reach. Okay. He's been fine. He's been fine. I think I think he's been the only stable part of our uh, bottom four better, sure. in my mind. But uh, well, no, well, 100%. I'm, 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 I'm happy to discover. I'm happy to discover the all you all you stand podcast. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, somebody <laughs> needs to do it. That's this is it. I I've been that's preaching this for years. We have both been me and Cole. Yeah. But but I guess the point what I was trying to make was that like. Yeah. No, you guys aren't wrong. Like, you know, like Hamannick, the thing with Hamannick at the end of the day is that I think, you know, he was signed for a reason, which was that Travis Green wasn't comfortable going into this season without another veteran body. You know, Hamannick, when he's been good in his career, has been a hell of a defenseman. He wasn't good, but he wasn't good in Calgary last year. Yeah. Um, and certainly, as everyone saw, didn't have a good start. And I think, you know, I think he, I think he gets a break on the start because he basically didn't have a training camp. Nobody had a training, you know. And and like, you know, the Canucks, the Canucks weren't unusual in, in how short their training camp was, not having preseason. Like that was a problem for every team in the league. Um, and so they they don't get cut as much slack in comparison. But I think Hamnick does because basically the guy hadn't skated for Dylan in the top right corner there cannot stand Hamnick and I can see him smirking over. He wants to say something right now, I can tell. Because he he does not like Hamnick at all and thinks he's I'm awful. not defending necessarily. I'm just saying yeah. he gets some slack for the first yeah, part. But sure. you're right. I agree. You, mm-hmm. you know, putting him in the lineup was basically like, let's see what he's got. Let's see how he does. I don't think yeah. his leash is going to be very long because like mm-hmm. you said, there is a decent alternative there in Ollie Levy who's been fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's your I mean, you get at the end of the day, like this is what I was referring to before, is that like because Hamnick has that sort of pedigree behind him, like it or mm-hmm. not, he's gonna get more of a look than a guy like Michaelis, who they're like, who the hell is this? You know? Yeah. Totally. Sorry, guys. Which oh. which speaks to the oh. team, right? That's... It speaks to the state of the team, unfortunately, because it's like this is how desperate things are. They can't actually roll the dice on a young player. They have to roll the dice, or you know, they're thinking. Their thinking is, well, we got to roll the dice on this mm-hmm. veteran guy who, you know, well, he once was pretty good, so maybe he'll be good again. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's like that's the bets they're making right now, and that's not a good place to be. Oh, well, and for yeah. me, I made a point about this in our podcast last night, and the troubling part about, and the reason why I really question Green on some of these decisions is not even like making that decision for Hominick over Ulevi. I understand that and like you said i understand the reasoning for it but it's it's how he brings these players into the lineup and he shuffles things up like why do you need to shuffle up hughes and ben i don't understand that they've been playing yeah, together for fine. a while like i don't understand why he can't just slot in and even this discussion of lefty versus righty i mean you guys play in the nhl like it's <laughs> like figure it out honestly especially if you're yeah. going to be hominick and you're playing a defensive style defensive defensive yeah. role letting Myers do his thing is the perfect place to be so these are where I sit here and I'm just looking at the opening lineups for games I just I'm boggled sometimes on these decisions I don't blame you and I mean I think yeah. it goes back to a little bit of what I tweeted about after mm-hmm. the game and I think at the end of the day um you know I've, I've tweeted a few times now and it's just like I mean I get why people want to criticize the coach and that's fine like like that's totally that's not the position I'm taking but I understand why people are doing it. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day it's about the roster construction. The roster construction's a mess. Like there's mm-hmm. just there's just not you yeah. know there's there's and 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 
a lot of that's management's fault. You know, I mean, that's that who picks the players. You know, people can blame the players and say, well, you know, they need to try harder. And I'm like, they're, I think they're trying pretty hard here, guys. Um, but, you know, and you can maybe criticize the coach for in game decisions or line decisions, sure. But at the end of the day, like I said, there's not a lot of options available to them. It's a lot of kind of, bleh, if that makes sense. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, I hear you. That's I not. Hear you. This isn't that's that's not good. I mean, that's that, and that goes yeah. above the coach, and that goes obviously well above the players. I want to ask you something because you obviously have a much better understanding of the depth within the organization mm-hmm. in terms of talent. And one thing that's been kind of worrying me is as our aging veterans get older, they're the ones that kill penalties, and none of these new guys coming in seem to be really um, interested in penalty killing. And as you know, Especially. we've lost ten of. Beagle's aging, and I can't see yeah. him being back after his contract. Um, we're using Miller there right now. Yeah. Edler, who knows what's going to happen? I don't know who's going to fill these spots in yeah. the future. Is there anybody in this organization who could? Well, it's you know that's a great question, and I think it's one of those ones that um, you know. I mean, I think it's funny you mentioned Beagle because I think it was last season maybe it was two years ago i, I time's such a blur now but between covid and what it's done <laughs> yeah. our brains and all just having kids um i think we're having a good chat with beagle about this a couple years ago and about penalty killing and i and also of all people louis erickson um because they're both good they're good at it and mm-hmm. and trying to understand what really makes it work and I think a lot of it, and, you know, and also talking to people about what they, because I think at that point, the Canucks were, I mean, it was early, early on. I mean, they're, they're doing well killing penalties now too. Right. But you know, it was, it was, it was trying to get a handle on maybe what influence Beagle had brought as a player in terms of just his talent, not, not the nonsense about, Oh, what is, you know, how does he teach the guys mm-hmm. to win or whatever? It was just literally like, what are, what are his skills? And, and um, it was about, it's not just about what you do in the zone where you're defending, where you're trying to force the other team into making decisions they don't want to do, even if they have an extra player. It's what you're doing like down ice. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, they talk about 200 foot clears, but like, they mean that, like get the puck down to the other end of the ice, because it, it's, it's, if you think about it mentally, right, that's, that's a, that's a focal point. Right. And they can play off that and they have a lot more ways that they can manipulate the other team get your first guy down there and you you drive the other team a certain direction for their breakout so that you can try to funnel them back you know and and that was something i remember i think i can't remember who it was mentioned to me but they're basically like this is something people's really good at and so um you know, and I remember watching, I was like, yeah, that's right. And I mean, but it, but it also just teaches you in general. So like, if you guys are really, you know, if that's something you're looking for, think about players who are really good at getting down ice and putting pressure on the puck, you know, like Tyler Maud is really, Tyler, this is why Tyler, Tyler Maud is such a yeah. good on penalty yeah. killer. Oh. Right? That part of it is how, how you miss the guys getting set up. Um, then it's also about, you know, what you do in the zone and your, your, your sort of spatial awareness and your, your ability to like take away space and I would say that, like, for all the criticism, you know, people love to rag on Edler for the trying to play goalie, but, like, he's been a good penalty killer for his whole career, yeah. and mm-hmm. so there's he's something awesome. to it, you know? Very and, and, you know, and, and I think, you know, I mean, him, it's about a stick. Like, he's very good, like, just taking space. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, it was something I recognized. I, I, used, when I, I used to be a teacher, and so I coached rugby. Mm-hmm. And one year, the first time I ever had a properly, like, big team, I was coaching was a bunch of high school kids but it was like properly big and you could actually understand like I literally could see why it is so appealing to have big athletes because they just literally take up more space like there's a physical space that they occupy that's more than a smaller guy and not that a smaller guy has to work any harder he just has to play differently and his angles have to be different so you know I mean there's there's going to be guys in the lineup already that can do this some of it's just about why, you know, when a coach has said, well, let's try to make you learn how to do this. I think I do sometimes think that this is one of those areas where coaches are guilty of overthinking it. Well, sort of with it. Well, he's never done it before, so he's never gonna be able to do it. Yeah. And you're like, well, like at some point they didn't do it and then they did. Yeah. It, you know? yeah. It's not like, it's not like they're, it's not like, you know, I, I have a hard time imagining that JT Miller, for instance, when he was 12 playing, you know, Pee Wee was like, 
they were like, oh, this kid's going to be an NHL penalty killer, so we better start him now. You know? Like, just he's a good player, right? He's yeah. a good player. He could do it. You yeah. know, and and it's it's, I think that's what it is. So you know, there's going to be guys coming through. I mean, certainly it's a skill set. Like if you're Jake, if you're Cole Lind, for instance, you know, if he's going to tr- ever going to make it, you know, it would be wise for him to try or to him to be deployed as a penalty killer in Utica so that he can figure it out before he gets to the NHL. Yeah. Right. Like, like, I mean, who was it? Was it Ray for, I think it was Ray Ferraro made this comment a while back, um, you know, before 1040 was, was axed. But I remember I was listening to one of his hits and he said, he said, you know, you want to be at it pretty soon. If you're not being asked to do more, you're going to be asked to do less. And it was a, it was in reference to Jake Rattanen, who you know basically wasn't on the power play, was playing on the fourth line, doesn't penalty kill, and it's like why are, you know what utility do you have? Mm. And if you're not killing penalties, and it was why it was interesting to see Adam Godet doing some penalty killing in training camp anyway, because it was like well maybe Godet can do it, and I think Godet actually probably could mm. do it. Um, but it was it was that kind of thing, right? Like you know what are the extra skills you bring to the table? So in you know go look at the minors. I mean I don't think Trent Call is necessarily been that forward thinking he's very much there to win games on a certain level i think get the mentality um of being like well these are who i have i'm here to win and if, if they're good enough they'll play and you're like i guess so but like you know well what is this team is, here he's for? supposed to be developing the players as well so down that's there it. that's also yeah. his job which right? is it yeah and i think there's generally been a tendency on his part towards going you know too much with veterans yeah that's not good Right. Well, I mean, he has a job. He has a job to do, but still, yeah. he, he's yeah. there to develop the guys. They're, the whole yeah. point of the AHL is to develop them so they can come in and be ready to get, play the NHL. Yeah, yeah. So. and I, you know, I, I, anyway, I mean, that, that's a whole other that's yeah. an organizational yeah. sort of. There's philosophy and then execution, yeah. and I think, I think the philosophy is there. I'm not sure the execution is always there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and cool. I think to your point, um, <clears throat> something Dylan, like I guess something that's important with this is you have to have players who want to be able to learn or want to learn and want and know strategically how to do this like being with the lions for a little bit seeing players who are you know fringe linebackers and fringe cornerbacks realizing that if i'm a really good special teams player i won't get kicked off this team because i'm now an asset and it's the same idea it's like you know 20 other guys aren't thinking that but the four who are will be on that lineup for a long time and we need to have players I don't know a lot about them personally but you know there needs to be a few players who realize that and are smart enough to learn that asset and take the time with a guy like Jay Beagle and like hey can we spend 20 minutes after practice and just go over this like Mm -hmm. let's just learn these little things because Mm -hmm. if you don't have guys like that in the lineup then I don't think you're gonna have a lot of success anyway but uh yeah it's I think it's an interesting thing to think about especially the evolution of like coaching and skills um you know there's a big difference between someone who thinks they know how it works and someone who actually knows how it works. And I I look back, this is like 20 years ago. Um, How old are you guys? How old are you guys? 25. Yeah. Okay. So, (laughs) so way back when, and this is the terror, this is a terrible error for the Canucks. They had a a guy named Darby Hendrickson who went on to be a sort of reasonably, you know, important Minnesota wild and their player in the early days after they joined the league. Anyway, Henderson was on the not very good, I think, 98, 99 Canucks. It's 99, 2000, one of those teams, which are just not very good. Like, they're just, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, they're waiting for kind of, like, the new wave to arrive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, I distinctly remember this, like, TV story about him. About him, his work on face-offs and how he was this, like, face-off specialist. And he actually wasn't that good. <laughs> but they went on all oh, blah 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 and he was they should you know he was the kind of guy that would work in practice you take all the extra draws and all this stuff and i remember thinking yeah but he's not that good like how is he a specialist <laughs> but there was someone had said well he must be and you're like yeah but the numbers say he's not and then you fast forward 10 years and the canucks add manny maholtra right. who actually is good at face-offs you know and, and it's one of these ones where like he's good enough that it actually is a factor worth talking about because it affects like you know, a face-off is, is nothing more than an organized puck battle. Um, but, you know, there are ways to set things up mm-hmm. that are different from a standard puck battle on the boards that still makes them different. Um, but they're still not as sort of 
as important, I think, as historically people thought they were. But nonetheless, a guy like Manny Malhotra actually knew his stuff. Um, and so you could see, you know, so a couple of years ago, I got to talk, you know, I was talking to him about, I think he was working with Bo Horvat. It was the first season Horvat really was emerging as one of the league's best face-off men. And, and that was sort of, that was that click. You're like, okay, this guy actually knows. Like, it's not just that he thinks he knows, he knows what he knows, you know? And, and it all kind of adds up. And it's a bit like the, the penalty killing thing. Like, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, he's a good penalty killer, but then you can go look at the numbers. Like, these are things that you can verify now. Is he actually having an impact? And that was always one of the interesting selling points with Louis Erickson was that, like, Louis was this incredible shot suppressor. Like, he actually was really good at getting, I mean, whether it was getting a stick on the puck or just getting in the lane or just making quick hands, you know, because he had quick hands. Like, yeah. So, you know, there are skills like that that matter. Bo, Bo, for a lot of his career, was a terrible penalty killer. He actually wasn't that good at it, which was surprising because he doesn't, he's not a dummy, you know, but. <laughs> he's very teachable. <laughs> yeah. I got I to gotta go in about two minutes. So let, what else we got? All right. No worries. No worries. Um, well, we were going to quickly get your thoughts, actually, since we only have two minutes here on the dynamic of, like, the team and the, like, the leaders. Like, who, before you leave, who, are, in your opinion, is leading this team right now? Because on ice, I'm not seeing it. More about i've been very disappointed mm. but that could be different in the locker room for all i know but like who's the guy right now trying to change this thing around because no one seems like they're doing it yeah it's, it's a good question it's tough to say you know we haven't been in that room for a year basically right right um, yeah you know i mean you can you you pick up clues on sort of the energy level the banter of that team and um it's a tough question you know certainly you know we we knew that markstrom and tan have carried a huge presence in that room i mean they're gone right so somebody else has to step in that has to become a thing you know i think you know it's not just it it, it, and i also i'm I'm trying to think more about this in new new ways because like the leadership group was you know became such a thing in the last 10 years and i think rightly so understanding that you didn't need just have one guy you needed to have a cohesive sort of broader sense the guys who have you know, and so you have a need to have an understanding of, 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 you know, who, who is sort of the most in, influential people in the room. And that's, I mean, that's inevitable in any group, right? Like any, any, any scenario you've been in, you know, if things are bad, sometimes that's because the people who are sort of have the, the biggest voices aren't the best leaders. Sometimes that really is a thing. And sometimes conversely, the best, I mean, generally, if there's a good vibe in your group, it's because you have a couple, there's some people that are stir the drink that are like yeah. good at that and they're good influences. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, I mean, it was interesting. I was listening to a podcast this week with, with the uh, really interesting former head coach of the Fiji Rugby Sevens team that won the gold medal in 2016, a guy named Ben Ryan. And he actually basically says he doesn't like the idea of the leadership group because it, because it, um, it, it essentially takes away from what you really need, which is that you need everyone. I mean, in, yeah. in, in a way yeah, you yeah. need yeah. everyone to be a leader. Totally. Yeah. I mean, which isn't to say that the quiet guy needs to not be the quiet guy, but it's a, it's a sort of a cultural value that everybody needs to have and everybody needs to be steering the same way. And, you know, I think some of it might be a bit of a chicken and the egg thing. Cause like, do you have that? When you, certainly you have it when you're winning. Right. But are you winning is it, are you winning because you have that or do you have that because you're winning? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and when you're losing, that's the hardest thing to maintain. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about that. So, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, there, there's no doubt that Pedersen, I mean, PD, of course he does, right? Like he's their best player, mm-hmm. you know, Hughes, I think is quietly is that kind of presence as well. Um, I think Edler as well. I'd say that's fair. Edler for sure. Cause Edler's just been there. Like he, yeah. by, by his very existence, has to be he's not yeah. a super talkative guy but he's a guy that sets a presence leads on the know? ice yeah you know and um you know i think that's probably kind of where they're at i i feel like myers probably is too he's because he's he is a vocal talkative guy you, you can mm-hmm. see who we inevitably end up getting interviews with you know because a lot of the time we're you know we can throw names and if we're at if there's certain players we want to talk to like today mm-hmm. we have jace howard because i asked for him and said well let's talk to someone new mm-hmm. um but, you know, if you guys ever pay attention to who we get, especially on an off day when there's no game, that's usually the Canucks of Sir Pick. And there's generally guys they go to. So okay. Sutter is a guy we hear from a lot, you know. <laughs> but the other problem is, is that if your leaders are not, you know, in the end, if they're on the fourth line, like there's not as much as they can do. Like they have an important role. Like B.J. Beagle and Brent Sutter obviously play important roles on the team in terms of they kill a lot of penalties. You know, they're looked to to be face-off specialists, you know. Um, but... But at the end of the day, you know, if your top guys aren't 
aren't scoring, that's going to filter down, you know, so Pedersen's feeling frustrated, if Miller's being frustrated, you know, that's human nature, that's going to filter down. So, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes back to how well are the best players playing? And are they feeling, you know, connected with the other guys? And I think that's clearly been an issue for a lot of this season. Yeah, I just, I just feel like, uh, sorry, if you have to leave, just let me know yeah. any moment here. But... I, I'm going to have to, I'm literally going to click leave because I got to okay. go. <laughs> yeah. Thanks right. for coming on. Yeah, yeah. thanks for yeah. joining us. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no yeah, worries. Take care. All, All right. right, later. Bye-bye. So yeah, that was Patrick Johnson. He is on Twitter as, what's his Twitter handle? I forget what it is. <laughs> it is Rising Action. I actually, he's a good follow. I, I have him on Twitter. Austin, you were saying that you don't know who he is because you're not on Twitter, but if you are, he is actually a very good follow. Um, I've followed him for a while now, and I, I like, he has very good insight on, on a lot of things about the Canucks. So a lot of these media guys are, you know, they actually, like, like even Jeff Patterson, like, they're all really, really good at, like, what they do. Like, they, you know, um, they're good people, and we appreciate him coming on our podcast. But, um, yeah, give him a follow. He, he's got good in, insight on the Canucks prospects, like Jet Wu and Rathbone, and writes stories about them. So, um, he does great work over there. But that uh, that in depth look at the prospects was really interesting. I yeah, thought. no, I don't, I don't, I don't. My, that's not my knowledge, so I can't really say much. I kind of let him talk there, but mm-hmm. I'd like to get more into that, to be honest, because I'm not very knowledgeable on that. Well, yeah, me you just that's don't get these type of conversations ever. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, how many guys do we have that know these type of things? Very few, even in the media. And yeah. it seems like it's not a priority to talk about. And we also never get them together. It'd be cool if you got a few guys who really knew yeah. what they were talking about together on something like this. And did it? they did do a long form, interesting chat about it. Yeah, no, he had a lot to say, but it was good. It was very insightful the way he, the way he was talking there. Um, we, yeah, we'll have people, to see if we could get him back or something. Yeah, I, I a little to. bit longer because it was good, good talk. Just so the listeners short. know, we're probably gonna have Jeff Patterson on next week. It's not a guarantee, but it's looking like we are at this point. So that'll be fun. I've always wanted to talk to Jeff Patterson. I I think he's one of my favorite media members because um, I've gone back, I've gone at him a couple times on Twitter, but <laughs> whatever. But, <laughs> but I do, you know. But uh, no, that'll be cool. Um, yeah, that was good. One thing I wanted to say, though, um, for us, po- our podcast, is I think going forward, we need to talk about Nate Schmidt Edler more. Uh... <laughs> just kidding. I mean, um, I'd really appreciate if we did a couple in-depth, just part <laughs> seven series of uh, Nate Schmidt's, the woes and the, the faults. I think we should do a whole podcast on it for like three hours. That's what I... No. Um, I was going to add though to the whole leadership thing like okay like i think these media members definitely like you get certain information but you're never going to get too much um no, no. hate or anything and that's totally yeah, fair that's i mean fine, that's yeah. it, that's just the reality of their job and t- also probably being the way we are where we criticize is not a long-term approach if we wanted to be journalists right like yeah. you would piss off a lot of people so but so there's the pros and cons but in terms of a leadership thing like i think it's simplified to say that um you know everyone should be a leader or the leadership group is more of, or less i think like it's definitely a thing like i don't know if you guys have ever worked in jobs that are good in terms of environment or bad but i've done both i mean the one that was bad there was really like there was no one that um greets you when you first start working, introduces you to people. Mm -hmm. Everyone's kind of a little bit hostile because no one really ever got introduced to a a healthy environment versus the good workplace where you show up, a few different people talk to you, come have a chat, uh, take some time to actually get to know and understand you and then help integrate you into the group. And you got to wonder if that's happening, right? I mean, we got a lot of good guys on our team, but we also got a lot of quiet guys. I mean, Mm -hmm. and there seems to be kind of two or three different groups of guys hanging out and it makes you wonder like i i had a a really good workplace environment in my past and i never i wasn't great buddies with everyone but i at least you know you get that whole feeling like everyone's got your back and you're a team and you uh, you need to have that and do you really see that on the ice i don't so it makes you wonder what i'll say to that is that's why i don't like what miller's doing because he's making like it's almost like this awkward anger and if you're if you're around him 
you don't know him that well if you're a new guy or a young guy. You don't know him that well. And he's getting all pissy. It just makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Like, there's a way to lead, but, like, I don't think doing it that way is the right way to do it. Well, and uh, let me throw a, a situation to you. You know, you're Niels Hoglander. You're coming in. You're trying super hard. You've earned your way out of the second line with the captain, Bo Horvat. You're doing everything you can. All of a sudden, you know, you throw one bad hit. Guys taking shots at you. There's been a few different times in a few different games uh, where guys are taking shots at him. In the meantime, he never really got integrated to the group maybe COVID maybe had a factor in that, but you know, he's talked to the young guys. He talks to Pedersen, but due to COVID, they don't do a bunch of hanging out. He doesn't really know the older guys. Maybe he doesn't really know Bo Horvat. And then he sees a big scrum where Horvat's standing off to the side. That's supposedly the captain. And you know, his teammates are getting hit and he thinks, man, this guy who's on my line is supposed to be the captain. And I don't yeah. really know or talk to ever doesn't have our back so i gotta now be more careful when i go into something because this my centerman isn't gonna help yeah i i, I before we left the chat there i was about to oh, not throw horvat under the bus but just be like like it's just not good enough not even close like like you can be horvat doesn't even a quiet leader he's not a quiet leader he he's he's not a quiet guy and if he was a quiet leader, then I'd saw like Henry Sedin even. I like he was a quiet leader, I'd say, in my on ice he was, yeah. on the ice he was. But Horvat isn't that way. But then what is he doing? <laughs> you know, like not gonna be oh. a quiet leader. He's doing nothing. Yeah. And I'll say this, like, I don't know. I I see this or I started to notice this a lot being in the locker room of like the Lions and starting to understand that. You have to have a little bit of empathy for these guys in the sense that really most of them don't have a lot of actual life experience and that's not a knock on them. It's just the nature of being a pro athlete and that journey that you take, especially as, you know, football, it's a little bit more exaggerated, I'd say, but hockey is the same way where a lot of these guys are pampered growing up they're, you know, they, they are the, the, the rich hockey family where their kids got to go and, and they just basically kind of get towed along the line because they're really talented and they are whatever. They're just the best in their group. And, and they never have this hardship or really having to be a leader. And even in like, you know, a, a minor hockey, there's no real leadership there. Someone gets slapped a C because they're the kid's coach. And then the, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. there's no, nobody, there's no real leadership there. You find that very, very few times in your career growing up so yeah i just have a little bit of empathy and understanding for these oh, guys for sure. and that's why it's 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 definitely tough to demand certain things from these guys but it helps me kind of understand why there is these leadership struggles because some of these guys never are you know kind of to his point of, of having the lack of individual accountability to be a leader for your, like, even for yourself, just being able to look to the guy next to you and, and be like, I'm here for you. You're here for me. We go to war together. That mm -hmm. whole mentality kind of gets thrown out of the window when you can be like, Oh, well, yeah, my captain's not doing anything. So well, I'm not going to do it. Like, you know, and exactly. that we definitely are, have a lack of that in our locker room. And, and That's once again, I just say that like, the coach once again has got to be the guy who steps in and yeah. sets that ground if no one is yeah. doing that because he's the one with the totally. experience he's now got that life experience after hockey to to know where these adjustments need to be made so it's frustrating yeah, that's the one thing i didn't You're like right about that that's the one thing i like henderson but that's the one thing i didn't like about him and i thought that was lacking from him but but you have a like to Austin's point, which is mm -hmm. I think so true. You can have the situation where um, I went. I don't think Henrik would have been um, as defenseless for his teammates as Bo Horvat is. He would at least go and try to pull someone off. But mm -hmm. the there is that truth where you can have a really good player who's maybe um, a little softer or doesn't lead that way. If you have a coach like Elaine Vigneault, who d kind of fills that void for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is a coach's job. And Austin's absolutely right about that. Yeah. that's really And honestly, and honestly, I don't, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if you see Montreal take a bit of a turn. I don't know what um, Ducharme or whatever his name is, is like as a coach. I know he's I can been see there before. Being that way though. Burroughs, yes, that's a good point. That is a good point. Yeah. He could be the guy who steps in and takes wrap it. this up. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. my bad. My computer decided to quit on me. So that's okay. We'll have to stop that. That's over. All right. but, so, yeah, like I yeah. said, mm. go ahead. You can, you can pick oh, it up. No, no, I was just done. No. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, next week, hopefully, Jeff Patterson will be on. We'll, we'll have uh, a lot more coming our way because we've been reaching out to a lot more people. And, uh, okay well okay colin also but, you gotta be fair like okay tuesday we're gonna be doing uh one with what pucks on net uh yeah. podcast i know you yeah. got a heart on for jeff pat but then we got jeff patterson sometime next week friday uh i think friday night we're gonna try and do that one okay and we got uh brandon <laughs> bachelor's next sunday hopefully as well okay and uh yeah i don't know get a couple other people in send well, send some more people your way yeah, yeah, you gotta do it though. Right now is the time to do it. Yeah. Wait. Uh, am I supposed to be on the pucks on net one? If you want, yeah. You you can be on any of them. I just don't want to sit here and get mad at you for not being on them. Like, do what you oh. want. I'd prefer if you were on it though. <laughs> All right. We'll, see. well, we'll see. do what you want, but I would prefer another voice. Like, it's always good to have one, two, vo- three voices. You're gonna like one day I'm gonna just explode on the wrong guest and you're gonna be like Why would jumped I over on <laughs> I don't care about that. <laughs> it will be known. It's like, oh yeah, don't go on that guy's podcast. No, no. no that'll be the oh, clip yeah. that gets us famous, Dylan. It'll be the one. <laughs> yeah. That rant, all right. like you said. But all, all right. right, Austin, take it away. Thank you for listening to the hockey hour.